welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone who's in. We've got a nice small group tonight, uh, and we're going to be talking about spousal maintenance. Okay, I see um, Khadija has also just registered. She should join us shortly. So, guys, tonight's webinar I've decided to call Demystifying Spousal Maintenance. We're going to be talking through a few of the basics in terms of what is spousal maintenance? Where does it come from? Uh, how do you deal with spousal maintenance claims? Um, obviously, I see we've got tonight quite a few mediators. In fact, um, I'm very, very bedad tonight. Apart from Lee, I've got a, uh, ah, and now Khadija, who's also an attorney. The rest are, are all mediators. So, um, Obviously, you know, one of the things that, that we must realize is in acrimonious divorces, parties are generally very, very upset with one another. And if you think that parties will fight about paying maintenance or not paying maintenance um, towards minor children, uh, we ain't seen nothing yet. You know, obviously, when it comes to the issue of paying maintenance to a spouse or an ex-spouse, it is a very, very unsavory prospect for a lot of people. Now, tonight we are all regulars. I'm not going to go through house rules and etiquette. I'm not going to go through my business card and LinkedIn. I think with almost all of you uh, here tonight, I have spoken one on one before and we are in contact with one another. So let's have a, a lacquer interactive one and let's start with basic principles. So. When we talk about spousal maintenance, we are dealing with what is referred to as a reciprocal duty of support between spouses. This comes from a long uh, history of case law that has established this, as well as um, a common law going back be far beyond the case law um, to our uh, Roman Dutch history roots. And what this reciprocal duty of support entails is specifically the duty that the spouses have towards one another in the marriage to maintain one another financially, etc., etc. What we must understand about this first, uh, shall I call it a maximum in terms of spousal maintenance, is that it consists of two parts. And we must realize that the reciprocal duty of support between spouses endures stante matrimonio. Now, stante matrimonio solely, uh, simply means whilst the marriage is in existence. So whilst the marriage exists, there is a reciprocal duty of support between spouses. The second maxim that we must predicate our discussion on spousal maintenance on is the fact that the reciprocal duty of support between spouses, unless an order is made to the contrary by a court, um, comes to an end the minute a decree of divorce is granted. And this is in terms of statute. Very, very warm welcome, Steph. Long time no see, Khadija. Very, very warm welcome. And Tando, also very warm welcome to you. Um, we are a smaller group tonight, guys, so please do feel free to uh, put your hands up and, and ask questions and or make comments in the, the comment box as we go on. So these are our two foundational principles, and I'll show you why we get to those foundational principles in a second, but let's use this as the starting point to our discussion on spousal maintenance. Number one, that there is a reciprocal duty of support between spouses, stante matrimonio, i.e. whilst the marriage is in existence. Once the marriage comes to an end by means of a divorce or an order of court, the reciprocal duty of support comes to an end. And this is where we have to look at the legislative framework behind um, spousal maintenance. Now, this common law duty of support is just that. It is a common law principle. There is no legislation that says 
whilst you are married, you must support one another on X, Y, Z terms. It has all been established by means of our common law, because I mean, it is quite a quite an obvious thing. Um, whilst I'm doing this webinar tonight, my wife is phoning to get the takeout and she's paying with my card because I offered her that she pay with my card because I'm doing the, the webinar and she's looking after the four year old. And that's how, you know, it works within a marriage. So you don't really need to legislate that. However, whether, uh, the real, um, problems come in and the real controversy comes in is obviously when my harki my liffy is no longer my harki my liffy and when we believe um, in that situation that they are um, not a very very nice person at all putting it mildly that's where when the reciprocal duty of support comes to an end at date of decree of divorce where the legislature has had to step in and they did step in in a fairly big way in the Divorce Act 1979. So guys, those of you who deal with spousal maintenance very, very frequently um, in terms of either mediation or in the context of litigation, this is your Bible together with the case law out there is Section 72 of the Divorce Act. And it reads as follows. In the absence of an order made in terms of subsection one, don't fret, not scary. Subsection one simply says, is there a settlement agreement? If there's not a settlement agreement, the court, with regard to the payment of maintenance by the one party to the other, having regard to the existing or prospective means of each of the parties, their respective earning capacities, financial needs and obligations, age of each of the parties, duration of the marriage, standard of living of the parties prior to the divorce, the conduct, insofar as it may be relevant to the breakdown of the marriage, an order in terms of subsection three. Once again, don't fret. This deals with um, marriages entered into before 1988, I believe. No, 1984. Sorry, Matrimonial Property Act, uh, where you were not yet able to get married with the accrual. You could only get married without the accrual. Under subsection three, um, you could ask the court to make a redistribution order. So not scary at all. Incidentally, this is under constitutional scrutiny at the moment, um, saying that it is unconstitutional um, in terms of the case law, which obviously I think some of you would have seen on the group and 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 and. and. and any other factor which the court, uh, in the opinion of the court, should be taken into account. Make an order which the court finds just in respect to the payment of maintenance by the one party to the other for any period until the death or remarriage of the party in whose favor the order is given, whichever event may first occur. Uh, death or remarriage, uh, and it's quite ironic that very often spouses pray for either may my ex-spouse meet their demise and or their new husband so that I can stop paying maintenance. Right, so... Let's talk about this section and let's first off try and take this whole quagmire over here and this whole mess and let's make it a bit simpler to understand. And I've broken it down without changing any of the wording. All I've done is I've put it in list form. All of a sudden, it is much easier to understand. Um, for the mediators among us, Understand these factors because these are the factors that you are going to have to use for your reality checking, for your partner, partner, whatnot exercise, your best alternative, worst alternative, probable alternative um, to a negotiated agreement. You're going to have to look at these factors and you're going to have to prod your parties attending mediation on these questions. Attorneys among us, I see at least one attorney, I see at least one candidate attorney. When you are in the middle of your very acrimonious divorce with um, spousal maintenance and you get to the point of requesting further particulars, your first question in respect of the claim for spousal maintenance or the plea, what does plaintiff aver? Are there existing means? What do they aver are the means of the plaintiff or defendant? What do they contend are the prospective means? What do they contend are the prospective means of the 
other party. And you're going to ask these questions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, in list format. And it really is an incredibly dangerous question to ask your opponent in terms of further particulars because they have to very, very succinctly uh, pin their colors uh, to the mast in terms of um, answering to those further particulars based on these different factors. Um, very, very warm welcome, Jessica, to, um, to the webinar. Um, right, so let's break down this section. So understand mediators, for you, this is a reality checking, but not, but not, what not tool. Uh, Attorneys understand that this is the basis of your request for further particulars for purposes of trial. The court may. Now, folks, I want to stop at the word may, which I've put in bold um, right in the beginning. Understand spousal maintenance is not an automatic entitlement. It is not like child maintenance where we have legislation saying that the co-holders of parental responsibilities or rights even if they're not co-holders, let's talk about biological parents, even a father out of wedlock who has not attained uh, PR and R must maintain the child. It's part of your responsibilities towards that child. Not so with spousal maintenance. It is a claim that must first be proven. So the court has a very wide discretion. OK, let's see how nicely I can draw with my mouse on my slide. Aren't you guys impressed? Discretion, and I've remembered how to spell discretion. So the court has a very wide discretion. In exercising this discretion, the court must have regard to a number of different things. The, part of the court must look at the existing or prospective means of each of the parties. It must look at their respective earning capacities. It must look at the financial needs and obligations of the parties. It must look at the age of each of the parties. It must look at the duration of the marriage, and it must look at the standard of living of the parties prior to the divorce. Then we're going to talk a little bit later about the party conduct insofar as it may be relevant to the breakdown of the marriage. Then the court must look at any order in terms of subsection three. Now guys, remember, an order in terms of subsection three, don't get freaked out, it's a redistribution order for people married before 1984 um, who are married out of community of property um, for them to get some asset sharing and wealth sharing out of the, um, the divorce. And then the final catch or any other factor which in the opinion of the court should be taken into account. Then we're going into the fact that the court may make an order. Remember the court may having regard to, so all of this is parentheses, the court may make an order having regard to those things which the court finds just. Now, just is an incredibly subjective term, not so. I'm sure you guys will agree with me. In respect of the payment of maintenance by the one party to the other for any period, just in case this wasn't enough of a crystal ball exercise and shooting in the dark with a blindfold on until the death or remarriage of the party in whose favor the order is given, whichever the event may first occur. So the court may make an order. Remember, it doesn't say the court may have regard to these things. The court must have regard to everything. It can decide what weight it places on it, but the court may make an order which it finds just in respect of maintenance for any period until the death or remarriage. Now, I want to go back to the section their conduct insofar as it may be relevant to the breakdown of the marriage. Now a lot of you in this meeting may say to me, but Mervyn, we have a no-fault principle for divorce in South Africa. And you would be absolutely right. We have a no-fault principle. We no longer assign blame in respect of getting the decree of divorce. 
the no-fault principle extends to the fact that a decree of divorce will be granted, which can be granted on one of two grounds, brought in incidentally in this very same Divorce Act of 1979, being continued unconsciousness or mental illness, or the breakdown of the marriage. Breakdown of the marriage is a very neutral term. It can be blameworthy in terms of you had an affair, therefore I um, believe the marriage is broken down, you broke my trust, or it could be, you know what, we're different people, we simply just don't see eye to eye anymore. We're still great friends. We're still great co-parents, but we just are no longer romantically interested in one another. For that, the fact that the marriage has broken down and that there must be a divorce, yes, we have a no-fault principle. Understand, however, folks, that for purposes of two sections of the Divorce Act, Section 7.2, which deals with spousal maintenance, and Section 9.1, which we're not going to deal with in detail today, but which deals with forfeiture of patrimonial benefits, the conduct of the parties is very, very relevant, and it remains relevant uh, in our law. So, when we talk of a no-fault principle, we talk of a no-fault principle in terms of the breakdown and the divorce. When you consider maintenance for the spouse, not for children, the conduct of the parties is incredibly relevant. What weight the court will put to this specific factor will depend on the circumstances and the judge and the court and the context and the breakfast and the weather and the all sorts of different things. But the fact that it is relevant, we cannot get away from. It was kept in as a fault-based principle in the very same Divorce Act, which did away with the no, with the fault principle in divorce. The other one, obviously, Section 9.1, which is forfeiture, which I'm not going into. So this is our Bible going into an understanding of spousal maintenance. For those of you who use the financial disclosure form postulated by um, the, the full bench and their judgment, which is now formed part of the practice manuals, the financial disclosure, affidavit for Pretoria and Johannesburg. Have a look at the last couple of pages. How frequently did you go on holiday? How frequently did you eat out? These all look at the standard of living of the parties prior to the divorce. Existing or prospective means is covered in terms of the first couple of uh, pages. What do you do? What are your qualifications? What assets do you have, et cetera, et cetera. So mediators, very simple. Before you sit and you start trying to flesh this out, make sure that you have in some way, shape or form. Now, understand I speak mediator. I'm not a mediator. I'm an attorney who speaks mediator. Whatever your process is, make sure that you have at least a cursory understanding of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine factors. The ninth is remember a catch all before you even go into a joint session because these things are going to come out. And if you want to reality check, you're going to have to say to a party, let's go on age, for example. And let's say plaintiff who is claiming is 58 years old, holds only a matric, which they got back in 19 foot sack, has not worked a day in their life. One of the things that you're going to have have to say from a reality checking point of view to their spouse who's fighting tooth and nail against paying maintenance is realistically the court will look at your wife's age or your husband's age they have not worked a day in their life in fact they don't even have a license they are 58 they are not going to get a job right now so suck it up there's going to have to be some maintenance bluntly stated please be more diplomatic with your mediation clients obviously folks attorneys understand that you need this before you get a summons out before you plead to a particulars of claim before you plead to a counterclaim or you put in a counterclaim have these facts because you are going to see what your client's soft underbelly or the opposing party's soft underbelly is very, very early in the game, and it's it could not be easier. What are your existing means? Mr. So-and-so, what's your salary? Okay. What are your prospective means? Have you got any other job offers? Are you coming into some money in, in the next foreseeable future? Have you got a, 
a, a wealthy aunt or uncle who's well disposed towards you, who is um, not doing so well, etc., etc. Ask these questions. Uh, what is your monthly budget? What are your financial needs and obligations? OK, so I'm getting preachy now. So I think I've belabored this point enough. Utilize section 7.2. Right, so that takes us into what the court can do. And I know I have covered this in a previous webinar, so please forgive me, those of you who have heard this before. But let's go through this so that we have it in this webinar for completeness sake. The court really can make four specific types of orders in terms of spousal maintenance. Now, let's go back to our mantra right at the beginning. There is a reciprocal duty of support between spouses which endures stante matrimonia. When the, du when the marriage comes to an end at date of divorce, the reciprocal duty of support ends. Therefore, the legislature brought in section 7.2 as a mechanism that the court may make an order for maintenance. If the court does not make an order, guys, and please put this in red marker on top of your notes, very, very thick um, font. If your client or one of your mediating parties does not claim maintenance in the divorce and the divorce decree is granted and there is no order for maintenance, the ship has sailed. The cool is dear the cat. We are finished. It is clear. Kaput. Gone. You cannot go back to court later and claim maintenance after divorce if there was not an order made in terms of Section 7.2 at date of decree of divorce. So, having regard to that, go back. We have our reciprocal duty of support that comes to an end because there's a, uh, a divorce. Now the court has to make an order. What kind of order can the court make? Number one, most cases we see rehabilitative maintenance. This is temporary maintenance to help the claimant spouse back on their feet. Let's take it back to the legislative framework so you can understand. Court may make an order which it finds just, respective payment of maintenance by one party to the other for any period that it deems just. Could be six months, could be 10 years. Depends on the facts of each case. Okay, so that is rehabilitative maintenance. Let's rehabilitate the spouse uh, back into the workforce. Lifelong maintenance is maintenance where there is no prospect of the claimant spouse being gainfully employed again, and you would then have to support them for life. This maintenance is literally their only shot at survival, if we can put it that way, and there's case law, which we'll look at a little bit later, which deals with, with that. Okay. Then we look at lump sum maintenance, which is a once-off large capital settlement in consideration of any future maintenance obligations. In your settlement agreement, it will look something like this. In full and final settlement and full and final release of any maintenance obligations, howsoever arising, whether past, present, or future arising uh, between the parties, plaintiff herewith undertakes to make payment to defendant in an amount of 2 million rand within seven days of date of decree of divorce being granted. Full stop. Next paragraph. Defendant herewith waives um, all entitlement to claim maintenance from plaintiff, whether same as past, present, or future arising, um, save as is set out above. For example, this is lump sum. One big payment. Have a nice day. That's the buyout. Okay. Now, token maintenance is a problematic one. And we have some case law to suggest. We'll have a look at the case law a little bit later, um, but not too much later. It is a placeholder order which is made at date of divorce, which enables the claimant spouse to approach the maintenance court at a later stage. Now, remember, guys, what I said earlier, the nice Afrikaans maxim, die cool is dear die kerk. If you don't get an order over here at date of decree of divorce, um, you can't go back and claim maintenance. So 
It is a placeholder order which is made at the date of divorce, which enables the claimant spouse to approach the court at a later stage. So the claimant spouse might not need maintenance now, but they might need it two years down the line. In those cases, it was always customary um, in the olden days for um, the court to grant one rand a month uh, maintenance. And we would see it quite a bit in the regional courts. And there's an interesting uh, KZN High Court judgment, which we're going to be looking at a little bit later, um, which deals with token maintenance. So understand that token maintenance um, is just a placeholder. It's in, there isn't an intent that it be used now. It's to keep the door open. Let's call it door stop maintenance for argument's sake. Okay. Now, before we go into case law based on um, standard, if we can call it that, um, maintenance um, section 72 claims, um, I want to just quickly refresh you guys. Um, these are some of the initiatives that we're running. For those of you who don't know, I think most of you are on the WhatsApp group at the moment. Unfortunately, guys, we can't open it up to candidate attorneys at the moment. WhatsApp has a an attendance maximum of 260 people, which means we have to be very, very careful with our vetting. Um, I have had a few candidate attorneys approach me, and for those who are in this meeting, if I see you enough and I see that you are passionate enough about family law, I might bend the rules, but I don't want to make undertakings. Um, then we have our conversations um, in terms of interviews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have our law in three minutes or less, and then we have our Think Legal webinars. Um, if anyone is not on the WhatsApp, please do get in touch uh, if you would like to be added. But I think most of you who are in today are there. Okay, Renal, I'm so glad that you're the first one to take the plunge and ask a question. Um, okay, if there was a rehabilitative order for a year and the party due to illness could not get employment, can the party go back to court a year after it elapsed and ask the court to grant maintenance once again. This is a very, very interesting question, and I'll tell you why. Because the court that would hear this would be a maintenance court. And the difficulty that we're faced with here is the maintenance court is a lower court. It has the status of a magistrate's court. You will not see any case law originate from the maintenance court. So, unfortunately, Renal, the, the overwhelming possibility is that 90% of these cases that would be sent to maintenance court after how much ever time would um, not be reported. So, we can't really set legal precedent by them. Okay, um, It would depend on the wording of the settlement agreement. If the settlement agreement says, for example, the defendant herewith records that they um, will only be entitled to maintenance from plaintiff until X date, and thereafter all maintenance obligations of plaintiff will cease. Um, it would be much more onerous for them to convince the maintenance court to entertain their matter um, than a settlement agreement which says, for example, in order to allow the defendant to seek gainful employment, plaintiff will pay rehabilitative maintenance for a period of blah, 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 blah. So it depends very much on the, um, excuse me, on the wording of your settlement agreement. That is why I am very, very passionate about saying to mediators, if you are mediating settlement agreements, get an attorney to check them for you. There are various attorneys who are happy to assist in the in this regard. Um, I think most of the attorneys that specialize in family law in my group would be happy to have a chat with you and walk a path with you. I myself do it very, very frequently. Have your settlement agreements checked. 
Um, Lee, are you making supper for for yourself and hubby, or are you in front of your PC? Can I can I uh, ask you a question? You can ask me your question, Mip. <laughs> Fantastic. Let me know if your pot's going to start boiling over, then you can run. Um, okay. You're in maintenance court quite a bit. Have you encountered this before? Um. So, look, we have. Obviously, I dealt with a big spousal maintenance matter in uh, Ramburg, uh, no. which ran for, for quite a few days. Um, you know, like you said, obviously the, the matters in maintenance court don't get reported. Um, and it's only if they take an on appeal that we actually get to see what the maintenance court can order in terms of uh, spousal maintenance. So it's mm. quite tricky. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the, the difficulty, Lee, in the matter that you had is the, the order from the high court specifically said that it would be sent to the maintenance court the maintenance court would adjudicate on quantum and duration which is different from where the high court would have for whatever reason said um the um there is maintenance in x amount now un understand guys it can be in terms of section 7 1 by agreement or in terms of section 7 2 after trial alfred very very interesting point plus was the reason that the party that got maintenance different from the reason the party now wants maintenance and there's another kink in that cable and it's one mediators that you're going to deal with quite a bit if if you have a settlement agreement and it says spousal maintenance will be x that party when dealing with the uncontested divorce when being questioned by the attorney will not testify on any of your Section 72 factors. There will be no testimony. So you won't have a court record to say why were they given maintenance if it was a Section 1. On a Section 72, absolutely, Alfred, I agree with you. You know, um, the court would generally, uh, in a contested matter, give uh, reasons for judgment. And then we can say, well, uh, you know, in maintenance court, here we are now, I'm going to actually um, use in my bundle referring the matter, the judgment of Honorable Mr. Justice so-and-so, which said um, that I am entitled maintenance to give me an opportunity to study. Unfortunately, COVID hit or the university burnt down. It's now a year later. I still need to study further. I don't have my degree or I um, made the horrendous mistake of going to study in Eastern Europe and I've now had to to flee and 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 you know not uh, making light of the situation going on there, but that's obviously something that has made the the news in recent year uh, recent days. In fact, is the the poor girl that had to flee and now can't finish her studies. Um, so I think it comes down to context. Lee, I agree with you hundred um, percent. There is very very little. Um, case law to suggest. Brunel, if I can give you a little bit of cheeky advice, though, the maintenance court is also very, very slow to make costs orders. So, you know, if you have someone who is um, wanting a, a variation for further maintenance, uh, I think the maximum that, that a lot of attorneys will tell them, and I'd love to hear from the attorneys who are in here as well, whether they agree with me, I think the advice that they would get is hoi milis. Go. What's the worst that can happen? They can dismiss it. Go and try. Yes, Lee, your hands up. Merv, also just to add to that, something that really throws a spanner in the works when we deal with maintenance matters, you know, stemming from, from a divorce settlement agreement, is also what the party got out of the settlement, you know. So in, in this particular case, um, obviously the estate was divided, not necessarily 50-50, but according mm. to, to the divorce settlement agreement, it says 50-50. The maintenance court is also now going to, you know, look at what means does the party have from the divorce settlement. So if oh, yeah. there's a house, could they use the house to rent out? And that also just makes stuff quite complicated, you know, when, we have, when we're having to run the maintenance trial. Absolutely. And I mean, that's one of your, your locus classicus kind of situations. Uh, and I don't want to get too sidetracked, folks. Sorry if, if we are. Um, in accrual divorces, where there is a um, element of spousal maintenance, it's very common to see that um, parties say, but listen, this is a rule 33-4, there must be a separation. Let's determine the accrual first. Let's see how much capital you've got. 
Um, let's see how much moolah you have. And here's a nice pro tip for those of your those of you mediators who missed it. Don't try and mediate spousal maintenance before you've mediated the accrual. Find out what the capital is. Alfred, I love it when you agree with me. Then I know I'm on the right track um, speaking to the mediators. You know, um, it's much easier to sell maintenance or the lack thereof to a claimant spouse if they have gotten a, a big capital settlement or if there's if you settle very favorably in terms of capital settlement to the other party, uh, the party paying spousal maintenance is much easier to sell uh, maintenance and understand guys that in terms of litigation, we have to put the, the cart behind the horse and do the same in mediation. Get the preliminary issues out first. Make sure everyone is nice and established and now we can talk. OK, cool. Second issue, we have an accrual. OK, let's talk about what is the accrual? Let's do the calc. Right. Give someone like Stella, who's also a bean counter, a call. If you're not a, a financial uh, mediator guru and say, right, let's go. Or if you don't have Stella's number and you should have Stella's number by now, Give your accountant a call or give your financial advisor a call and say, listen, let's go. Let's quickly get this accrual. OK, Mr. and Mrs. S, your accrual is this. Mrs. S, you're worth one bar. Mr. S, you're worth four bar. You have to give Mrs. S one bar so you are both worth two. No, 1.5 bar so you are both worth 2.5 at the end of the day because a total of five bar. Then once you say, OK, Mrs. S, you're probably going to get 1.5 bar out of this. Do you really still want to claim maintenance? Do you have a bona fide need for maintenance? That's what it comes down to. And let's go into our notable case law. I absolutely adore EH versus SH. It is a Supreme Court of Appeal 2012 judgment. And what EH says is basically this, and it sums up spousal maintenance beautifully and guys have it in your arsenal because you need it in your arsenal it is trite that the person claiming maintenance must establish a need to be supported if no such need is established it would not be just and the court quotes there from the act remember our requirement is just over there with my pencil um, just as required by the section for a maintenance order to be issued it is on this issue that the respondent's claim must fail in that case. It was an appeal from the High Court where the ex-wife wanted to claim spousal maintenance from the ex-husband, but she had already been cohabitating with another man who had already been um, looking after her financially. Um, very outmodish or old-moded uh, relationship dynamics, but there you are. It is on this issue that the respondent's claim must fail. Both she and the appellant had moved on with their respective lives and had formed intimate and lasting relationships with others. As I have stressed for almost eight years prior to the divorce hearing, eight years, how long can a divorce last? The respondent has had lived as another man's wife. <laughs> right. I don't know when summons was issued, but that's quite an interesting one, guys, for reality checking. Prior to the divorce hearing, the respondent had lived as another man's wife, a man who provided for her needs, put a roof over her head, and in all factual respects, treated her as his partner in life. This was a situation which both she and Mr. S, uh, I don't know why the full name is there, regarded as permanent and which they intended would remain. So sorry, G is just the, the portion in the um, judgment. So what is interesting from EH versus SH, and guys, do remember this is Supreme Court of Appeal, so all high courts are going to be bound by EH and they are going to follow it. Uh, I had a Rule 43 in the high court a few years back, um, a, a massive, massive Rule 43, where we argued on EH versus SH based on the fact that the applicant I was acting for the respondent was in fact a man of means, he was not a pauper, he was already cohabitating and had formed this de facto support relationship with his new permanent cohabitation partner and, 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 and we had a fantastic judgment 
based on EH versus SH, which is probably why I love it. But understand it is SCA. It's going to be binding on the high quartz. What does EH versus SH tell us, guys, if we really have to distill it down to bare bones basic? And I love distilling things down to bare bone basics. You know, the old lawyer's maxim, why use 10 words when 100 will do? We see it a lot in legislation and in case law. EH distilled down to three words, bona fide need. There must be a bona fide need for maintenance. If you do not have that bona fide need, your claim must fail. Incidentally, just so you guys do not uh, misunderstand um, the gist of this judgment, the court did not dismiss the ex-wife's maintenance claim because she was cohabitating. Not on that basis alone. It dismissed it on the basis that Mr. Smith, which the court um, and, and my law reports identify, um, were in a relationship where Mr. Smith was de facto providing for her needs. A man who provided for her needs put a roof over her head and in all factual respects treated her as his partner in life. So because the cohabitation relationship between E.H. and Mr. Smith led to a situation where he treated her as his partner in life and provided for her needs and put a roof over her head and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, she failed to establish a bona fide need. Now, what I'd like to do, if you guys will indulge me, let's quickly go back to our section 7.2. And what is very interesting about EH is it hammers on most of the judgment on the fact that she failed to establish a bona fide need. The judgment did not look at conduct. It did not look at duration. It did not even look at age. It looked at the existing or prospective means, their respective earning capacities and their financial needs and obligations. That's all it looked at. So the court said, look, I must look at all of these different factors, but I can decide what weight to put to each factor. And in this case, the weight fell squarely on is there a bona fide need? So if you do not establish that there is a bona fide need in terms of EH versus SH, your spousal maintenance claim falls flat like a flan in a cupboard, I'm afraid. So be aware, this is prevailing SCA judgments. I've seen very, very recently still Joburg High Court following it. Some of uh, my colleagues in other divisions of the High Court, please chime in if uh, you have dissenting opinions in your high courts okay so that's eh versus sh sca very critical judgment yes alfred talk to me oh mervyn i heard you say something sometime eh i've been very sleepy. yeah i'm gonna start billing you yeah no problem send, send me a, send me an invoice i'll send you a check in the email um great Mervyn, um just one thing i think that we need to also uh understand that maybe the needs are not a long-term need. Maybe it's uh, and and it's not rehabilitative maintenance. It's it's a different type of a s situation where someone needs short-term support in order to get onto their feet to buy a property or rent a property or to you know to to move on. So maybe yeah. do a step-in type maintenance uh, for a short period for a couple of months or whatever. Yeah, well, look, the I absolutely. I mean, that takes us back to the the wide discretion in section seven two. It may make an order which the court finds just in respect of the payment of maintenance by one party to the other for any period. What we see de facto is people not asking just for payment of maintenance. We are seeing uh, contributions to moving costs. We are seeing in rule forty threes. 
um, handing over of certain household items for example you've got two microwaves i've now moved into a bachelor's flat i have nearly a spoon to tap against another so i must have the second microwave um but you're quite right alfred you know a cow is not a cow is not a cow it's a frisian or a or it's a jersey or it's an angus or it's a moose in some cases um you know we are we must distinguish between the the discretionary difference in a court saying you need lifelong maintenance or you need rehabilitative maintenance and remember um, our starting key concepts it could be rehabilitative lifelong lump sum or token um, so please bear that in mind okay so let's go on to our next case uh, we remain in bloemfontein for this journey throughout the uh, courts of South Africa um, and we are now in the SCA's courtroom and not in at the Bry area in the courtyard where there is actually a Bry standing it's quite amusing that's how you know it is in the free state I see we don't have anyone from the free state in today so I'm safe making that statement Kruger nomine in officio versus Goss and another uh, 2010 2 SA 507 and it's an SCA judgment. I've copied the head note simply for a for ease of reference. Now, once again, guys, remember when we spoke about Renal's question earlier, I said it is critical to ensure that um, you have your settlement agreements. If you're not an attorney, checked by an attorney. Kruger tells us why. What happened in Kruger was this. Mrs. had a claim for rehabilitative maintenance after a decree of divorce. There was nothing in the order that said it would be enforceable against his deceased estate. Mr. then passed away. Mrs. went to court trying to claim against the deceased estate. The executor of the deceased estate opposed the claim and said, well, the spousal support or the rehabilitative maintenance is a part of the spousal duty of support and consequent liability for maintenance as incidents of a matrimonial relationship. The termination of the relationship by death brings the duty of support to an end. That is why in divorce settlement agreements, we put a provision in, and I'm not going to give the exact wording, have a cup of coffee with me and I might be persuaded, to make provision that the settlement agreement is binding on the party's deceased estates. Be very, very careful, folks, that you do have this in your settlement agreements. Otherwise, if there is an order for spousal maintenance and the one party passes away, you may sit with a problem going to uh, court trying to enforce your rights. And this is as a result of the principles laid down in Kruger ver in O versus Goss in another 2010 and once again, we are still in Bloemfontein. Right. Now let's go back to the promised land. Let's go to South Gauteng High Court in good old Josie. Right. Let's talk about MB versus NB. Um, I see a lot of mediators metaphorically smiling because I know mediators love judge or acting judge Brassie's judgment in MB versus NB all the way back in 2010. Can you folks believe it? Where he castigated my dear colleagues for not having advised their clients about the virtues of mediation. However, that's not all acting judge Brassie spoke about in MB versus NB. In fact, of the three head notes, the mediation point is the last one. Before that is one relating to spousal maintenance. And what is very, very, very interesting 
is that the judge decided that in considering the means of the parties, you must also take into consideration um, the costs of providing for their dependence. Uh, it's a very, very interesting um, portion that I copied here from the wording of the judgment. My apologies, guys. I see I didn't have the paragraph in there. It is a short judgment, so you will find it in there. If anyone is uh, struggling to find it, please reach out to me um, via WhatsApp after the session, and I'll, I'll see if I can find the paragraph. But you should find it. NB versus NB is on Safley. It's a very short judgment. Decide whether the spouse, the other spouse earns enough after making proper provision for the maintenance of a comparable lifestyle to make good any shortfall in the claimant's income that is exposed by the initial assessment. In other words, if spouse one has a lifestyle which costs 30 rand a month and they are earning 10 rand a month, their shortfall is 20 and arguing that they are married to Mr. or Mrs. Moneybags, who makes a thousand a month and has no problem um, contributing, the spousal maintenance claim would then be 20. So that's basically what this paragraph means. So you look at the shortfall, and that is what the claim would potentially be. In the process, due allowance has to be made for much more than just the party's personal expenditure. For instance, the cost of providing for dependents has to be brought into account, and this may range beyond those of the legal claim. This is very interesting, guys. And embrace moral claims by siblings, parents, and even friends. So if anyone foresees getting divorced in the next 10 years, start contributing to your stoner friends dop fund right now and make a status quo where you contribute 100 bucks to this benevolent fund if the avail available funds are sufficient to meet both sets of demands well and good but if not each party must make a sacrifice to in order to accommodate the legitimate demands of the other each party must make a sacrifice in order to accommodate the legitimate demands of the other and it's not clear whether Judge Brassie talks about no longer providing for your siblings or your drunk high school friend, uh, or whether it talks about making a sacrifice in terms of the other spouse must not contribute to their maintenance, but it's an interesting uh, step in our law nonetheless. Then let's put on our board shorts and go down to KwaZulu-Natal, and this is in the Peter Maritzburg High Court. So not quite, let's do our board shorts, but not yet our flip-flops. Let's keep our tackies on because we're a little bit inland. And this is a very interesting 2012 case, which is comparatively recent of MG versus RG um, 2012. And it is in the Peter Maritzburg High Court. And the reason I put it in, guys, is the judge here was very, very unkind to what was known at that stage as the Northern Divorce Court, um, which did not make token maintenance. And what the court found here is that claims for token or nominal maintenance are valid and capable of being granted as a matter of judicial discretion. So if a court sees that a party is capable of maintaining themselves now, but might not be capable in a year's time or two years' time, you may sit with a situation where the court will give token maintenance. I'm at pains to understand what kind of crystal ball the court would look at um, in terms of using that discretion to make nominal uh, token maintenance orders, uh, but it is alive and well, and that's what's important in this judgment. Stella, I see you've got your hand up. How's it? Hi, Mervyn. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you so much again, Mervyn. Anytime. But, um, I enjoy your uh, webinars always. No um, just when you said what crystal ball the court might have, I was just thinking, because um, I'm busy with a case where... Um, a couple wants to get divorced after 30 or more than 30 years of marriage and um, 
wife has not worked for for most of the time that um that they were married. Um, sure. She's 58, he's 62. Has, he, it, have his pension funds matured yet? Has he taken them? No, he's still working. But now the the, the problem is, um, and of course they're married in community of property, so she is going to take, um, you know, a, a, most probably um, we're going to settle on 50-50 um, split of the estate. However, um, his thing, his um, mindset is, um, you know, I'm 62, most probably going to work till 65. Okay. Yeah. We, we split the the assets equally. So, do I now have to to work until I'm 90, so that I can pay my my wife a spousal maintenance? Mm. You know. Um, so I think I guess it comes there. What is the um, you know, the, the, what was that one of the items that under section seven two? Let me go back to the slide for you, Stella. I think then let's go there. It's actually a very important point that you raise, and it's one I'd like to like us to discuss. Let me see if I can get an eraser and just get my doodles out the way here. Um, good. There. I, I was thinking of the age, you know, age of each party. Yes, the, the the wife is not at a, you know, she, there's no way she's not going to get a job now. Um, um, but one also needs to look, I think, at the age of the husband because yeah. his earning capacity is most probably for another three years, um, yeah. you know. Um, so surely that must be taken in consideration. And I can see this is going to be a problem for her uh, you know, if we say, okay, he's going to pay maintenance only for three years because the expectation is for the rest of her life. But Yeah, you see now, okay, so there, there's a few um, interesting factors that we need to look at, at here, Stella. And it's something that I think is very germane to, to the topic. And I think it's something that that let, let, let's just park here and let's talk about this. Um. Let's start from the understanding that late stage divorces are extremely complex. The mm -hmm. reason being that a very large um, proportion of the population make insufficient provision for mm -hmm. their retirement. Uh, and in these very old marriages, I say respectfully, you know, if it's 2022 now, they were married in 92, yes? Earlier. They were married for actually nearly 40 years, 38 years. Okay. All right. So if they're married in community of property from way back, the chances are you're sitting with a very, very, dare I say it, traditional dynamic. Mm. Dad is the breadwinner. Mom sat at home looking after kids. Mm -hmm. So mom has very little financial acumen very little appetite at her age to get financial acumen. And I say that respectfully and generalizing mm -hmm. horrendously. Um, and, and, and probably no RA of her own, no pension fund of her own. All the assets are sitting with dad. So what you would have to do in this mediation, and I'm sorry to break it to you, you are going to have to move heaven and earth to a large extent. Mm -hmm. You are going to have to mediate a joint retirement plan for mom and dad. And they are going to have to flip and understand the pot is just this big. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter in whose name the pension fund is, it is this big. That's what we've got. Um, and you're going to have to make it work. So my suggestion would be get a financial advisor or a certified financial planner involved with mm -hmm. you to work through it with you. Then understand i think it is eh versus sh um i think is the case that i was referring to and i want to make sure that i'm not no eh versus sh is this one it is i think it is dm versus sm uh supreme court of appeal judgment that found living annuities um can form part of an estate for an accrual calculation that has value Understand that there's notional value at this stage in terms of 
your division of assets so that assets are going to be divided as well as you're going to have to look at after the assets are divided so let's say dad is a pension fund what's mom going to do with that pension fund if she's 58 now um she can take it in cash or she can reinvest it in a pension fund of her own and get quite a few tax benefits if she lets it ride until the age of 65. Um, why am I saying all of this to you going the long way around? I want you to know that the age is going to play a huge role. There is probably not going to be a court in this country who would say after 40 years of marriage, mom not having worked a day in her life, I want to tell you that dad has more of a chance or a larger likelihood of becoming pregnant than not maintaining mom for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that much. Mm -hmm. uh, a court will not send this poor woman into the cold. They will not. So dad is going to have to suck it up and realize that whether the pot is worth millions or hundreds, that's the pot and that's what they have to live with. If he retires, obviously, there's different stories. There is going to be a living annuity if he's got a pension fund, which I'm assuming he does. Yes. So he's going to get an annuity income. So you need to find out from the financial advisor, um, is it a um, an ILA, an investment-linked living annuity, or is it a guaranteed annuity? How is it structured? Do they draw down from profits on the investment or... Is it one of those that are completely ceded to the pension fund and they get a, a guaranteed income? Because that is going to be income into dad's estate. And if mom gets a portion of the pension fund, she's also going to have income into her estate. Mm. And understand that, you know, earlier I said that in um, accrual matters, the uh, accrual is often calculated before you calculate your maintenance. Very similar in um, in community of property matters. Lee, if I'm not mistaken, the, the big maintenance matter she was talking about. Our clients in South Africa, dad is a very wealthy businessman, and I'm talking very wealthy. In one of the eastern countries, they were married in community of property, and the order that was agreed to in the high court was let, let's divide the joint estate. Once the joint estate has been divided, then we refer it to the maintenance court, and then we see what the um, what the maintenance obligation is. So, Stelaki, I'm afraid you've got a hell of a task on your hands because you're going to have to do a joint retirement plan for these people. And you're going to have to do it with knowledge of what products they've got, what mm -hmm. the benefits are under those products, and how to, to um, best divide them. Another pro tip here, probably dad has a financial advisor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did. Probably don't use him. Get someone impartial. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Stella. Oh, I feel cut giving you this advice. <laughs> I hope you forgive me. Yeah, it's fine. Alfred, Thank you. Alfred, have you got from a, another mediator's point of view uh, an opinion on this? Yeah, um, I do have. Uh, very good advice, Mervyn. I agree with everything that you've said. Just an add-on to that, and um, maybe what maybe something Stella could do is she uh, she could be creative. And when I say creative, I don't know if it's legal or not. Uh, maybe you can add the the legal the legal side to this, but maybe yeah. He maybe, asked nervously. Yeah, I'm asked nervously, as you say. Uh, maybe. Um, they can do a horizontal claim to children, um, like you do with uh, child maintenance. Uh, maybe there's a possibility children can start uh, contributing towards the mothers. Um, yes and no. And I'll tell you why yes and no. Because your claim between spouses, your reciprocal duty of support between spouses trumps all other claims. That mm. is your primary um, person who you have to claim from. So if dad is not able to, to support mom, then she can claim from the kids. But you see, now this becomes the case. I had a maintenance case years back. Dad's a multimillionaire. Um, dad's son is the father of the child. 
who's a, a nothing. He's a, a Zolkop, nothing against the Zolkop who might be in tonight. Uh, I know very, very um, powerful and very, very good Zolkop, but he was not one of those. He was the listening to Fish albums and and Pink Floyd records, nothing against Pink Floyd, incidentally. Um, Zolkop, you know, and then we went to maintenance court and the maintenance court said, but he doesn't have means. We said, but OK, then let's go go after grandfather, you know, but if he were to work for grandfather's company, get 10,000, then it would be capped on his means. Is that just or not? Well, unfortunately, Lee pointed out earlier, maintenance court is a magistrate's court. It becomes a problem. Steph, no problem. Thank you so much for well, for sticking around with us. Appreciate it. Um, I'll make the recording available eventually together with the one from Alfred and Dwayne and my session, which is long outstanding, which I'm going to get clapped for, as well as last week's session, which I'm going to get clapped for. But as soon as it is out there, I promise it will, it will be, it will, I will release them once the state of disaster comes to an end. How's that? <laughs> okay, right. Um, let's go on. Um, very interesting question. Thank you, Stella. And thank you, Alfred, for your input there as well. Right. So let's go to Cape Town. Let's go to the mother city and go look at AS versus CS. Uh, which was a 2011 decided case from the Cape High Court. And the Cape High Court, incidentally, guys, is some very, very interesting uh, judgments of late um, Cape Town-based attorneys. I think there's one of two two of you here. I, uh, I really think after this year of judgments from your division, you will all be, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> on Kolmierpille or on hard liquor or something, but good luck to you. Okay, now this was a very, very groundbreaking case uh, and it dealt with um, same-sex marriage or civil partnerships, uh, which said that partners in a same-sex marriage or civil partnership um, also get relief under Rule 43s, as if we needed a court to tell us that, you know, they have the same status as a marriage and they have relief under Rule 43. Um, so I'm putting it in just to dot our I's and cross our T's. OK, now let's stop there for a second. I've got another eight slides, including the ending credits to go through. Uh, have we got any comments, questions, queries? Uh, up to this point, apart from the ones that already have been dealt with. Alfred, I see your hand is up. Is it still up or is it a new question? Tando, no problem. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Goodbye. Still up. Still up. Okay, cool. Uh, any other questions, folks, whilst I quickly um, break the social contract, which I referred to earlier, and order McDonald's for my wife and I because she hasn't had time to get dinner ready. <laughs> Um, okay, any questions, comments, queries? Okay, now let's go a step back. Let's understand the nature of Section 7.2. Section 7.2 deals with divorce matters. It comes out of the Divorce Act. So let's quickly go... Um, if this, then that. If divorce, then Section 7.2, but not always divorce, and when not always divorce, if I may speak programmer, not always divorce when no marriage. So let's go through some of our, open quote, other scenarios. Very, very, very important judgment uh, launched at that stage by Judge Cathy Satchwell, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't think there were any other Judge Satchwells at that stage. Satchwell versus President of the Republic of South Africa and another 2003 4SA266. Uh, this went all the way to the Constitutional Court, folks. And ironically, it did not deal with any of our divorce legislation. It dealt with sections uh, 9 and 10 of the Judges Remuneration and Conditions of Employment Act. And what this section, these sections provided way back in the day 
was that a surviving spouse of a deceased judge would get certain benefits. The provisions were found to be discriminatory in that same sex partners by implication were denied such benefits. Uh, the provisions were accordingly declared unconstitutional. The words or partner in a permanent same sex life partnership in which the partners have undertaken reciprocal duties of support are to be read in after the word spouse. Very groundbreaking uh, case um, for same sex life partnerships. Understand, guys, uh, that this was way back in the halcyon days of 2003 when the new generation iPhones, as well as COVID and wars in Eastern Europe, were still a glimmer um, on the horizon. Right, so this is very, very groundbreaking and a lot of uh, family law judgments, traditional family law judgments, rely quite heavily on Satchwell versus President of the Republic of South Africa and another. Then we have an important decision uh, in Pretoria, in case uh, my Pretoria friends think I'm completely averse to going north of the Yixke. I am not, but I would prefer that all of you come south of the Yixke. Um, Khan versus Khan, 2005, Volume 2, Essay Law Reports, page 272, the Transvaal Provincial Division. And what was interesting about Khan versus Khan is it dealt with the situation of a polygamous Muslim marriage. Um, and basically the argument was that the one party said it is a contra bonus moris to grant a Muslim wife married in accordance with Islamic rights maintenance where the marriage is not monogamous and the court said it can no longer hold water. It will be blatant discrimination to grant in the one instance Muslim wife in a monogamous marriage the right to maintenance but to not deny a Muslim wife married in terms of the same Islamic rights which are inherently polygamous, the court found there, and who has the same faith and beliefs as the one in the monogamous marriage, a right to maintenance, and the court granted um, maintenance um, to the um, wife in that case. So the courts as far back as 2005 have been fairly forward thinking uh, as a result of this desperate need that we've had for marriage law reform in South Africa. Right. Then I want to go to a final judgment before I want to just bring all of this together um, and go into questions and answers. McDonald versus Young 2012, Volume 3, SA Law Reports, page one. And once again, we are putting on our best values and going to Bloemfontein to the SCA. And what was interesting about McDonald versus Young is this was not a case of people who could not get married. Now understand inherently the court was very pro Satchwell at that stage because there was discriminatory public policy. Uh, the same as in Khan, and incidentally, uh, even after our Western Cape High Court, we are still waiting for Parliament to get their act together in regards to Muslim marriages. Um, and we are still having, uh, I'm sure some of my uh, colleagues here will agree, some difficulty in um, dealing with litigation regarding these matters at present in the interim. Not so for McDonald and Young. McDonald and Young were a heterosexual couple who were unmarried cohabitants. They simply decided not to get married. And a very clear distinction is drawn between McDonald and Young versus Khan and Khan, as well as in the case of Satchwell. Um, a duty of support may arise, folks, between unmarried cohabitants, okay? It can exist. It is out there. But it's not there for the taking. It is not by default. 
it does not arise by operation of law, but it may arise by agreement between the contracts. We agree that we will be reciprocally responsible for one another financially. There's no law that says, Maharki Mailifi, who I don't want to put a ring on the finger, um, I have to support you, but I can, in terms of an agreement, say, you know what, I am going to pay for X, Y, Z. I am going to support you in X, Y, Z manner. You buy groceries, I pay the rent, and, and, and. However, you can't simply say that that agreement existed. Where it is alleged, such agreement tacitly concluded um, evidence and conduct of the parties must justify the inference. So you have to plead and allege sufficient facts to prove and then you must prove those facts um, to ascertain that there was or to establish that there was in fact an agreement between the parties. The court looked very favorably in this judgment on the constitutional court judgment of Daywood and another versus Minister of Home Affairs, Shalabi and another versus Minister of Home Affairs, and Thomas and another versus Minister of Home Affairs, where the constitutional court had this to say. And let's just take it back. We are living in a an age of equality where people have different lifestyles and we are all presumably and hopefully, or at least we're getting there, equal under the law and hopefully getting to a point where we all have equal protection. That being said, the Constitutional Court had this to say. Marriage and the family are social institutions of vital importance. Entering into and sustaining a marriage is a matter of intense private significance to the parties to that marriage, for they make a promise to one another to establish and maintain an intimate relationship for the rest of their lives, which they acknowledge obliges them to support one another, to live together, and to be faithful to one another. The institutions of marriage and the family are important social institutions that provide the security, support, and companionship of members of our society and bear an important role in the rearing of children. The celebration of a marriage, listen to this, folks, gives rise to moral and legal obligations, particularly the reciprocal duty of support placed upon spouses and their joint responsibility for supporting and raising children born out of marriage. These legal obligations perform an important social function. In other words, I'll take my glasses off saying this because I might attract a few punches saying this, but I'm just quoting the Supreme Court of Appeal and the SCA. Don't treat a cohabitation relationship as if it is a marriage. It is not. It may be a romantic relationship. It may be a beautiful relationship. It may be a great relationship. It may be an awful relationship, but it is not a marriage relationship. In terms of the constitutional court judgment in David Shalabi and Thomas versus Minister of Home Affairs and, another, and others, the constitutional court made it very clear that Marriage is a unique institution which gives rise to certain um, reciprocal duties by law. Law, folks, the law says I must maintain my spouse. The law says, in terms of Section 7.2, I must potentially, after divorce, pay maintenance. Not so in cohabitation. There is no Section 7.2 for cohabitation. We look at the principles of civil contract. What was the contract between the parties? The contract can be very specific. I'll buy milk and eggs, you buy bread. I pay rent, you pay water and lights. I look after the kids, you pay for everything. It gets a bit more vague. I Take the kids to school every day. You go fetch them, but you must work 10 hours more than me because this, 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 this. The agreement could be anything. And in that case, the court doesn't necessarily look at enforcing a maintenance claim in terms of Section 7.2, which we went through earlier in this presentation. The court looks at what was the contract between the parties and what order is just and equitable as a result. Mediators.
How do we get past this? Easy peasy. Cohabitation agreements. If you have clients who want to cohabitate, you say to them, okay, come on in. Let's talk. What obligations do you want to give rise to? What obligations do you want to exclude? Do you want to exclude specifically things like universal partnership? Do you want to specifically include universal partnership? So in closing off, we're going to go into question and answer now before I rush off to scarf down my McDonald's. Um, let's distinguish between three classes of person in terms of maintenance claims. First profile you're going to see, married person getting divorced. Section 7.2 is your Bible. End of story. Then we go to unmarried person who cannot get married or person married in terms of unrecognized marriage rights, i.e. there is no civil marriage, but there is a religious marriage. Then we're going to look at case law. We're going to look at con versus con, for example. And your third class of person is people like Mr. and Ms. McDonald and Young. Uh, I don't know who was Mr. or who was Mrs. in this case. I can't recall. Who can get married but choose not to. And in that case, you have to look at is there an agreement? What is the terms? What are the terms, my Afrikaans, coming through there of that agreement? And how to enforce that agreement in a manner that would be just between the parties. Um, that is the end of the formal section of this presentation. I have been Mervyn Vermeulen to those of you who have not yet met me, which is no one who is still present tonight. Um, all of us have met and chatted before. Thank you so much for taking the time to... Uh, attend this presentation. I hope to have the slides and the recording up soon. If I don't, please do not have me shot at dawn because then I will be shot at dawn numerous times because I still owe you guys two other presentations as well. Right, let's go into questions, comments, queries. Uh, does anyone feel uh, that they have had this uh, demystified a little bit. Um, okay, um, let's go through some questions. Okay. Um, Stella asks, should the cohabitation agreement be in writing? Absolutely. Contract can be one of three things. It can be in writing, it can be oral, or it can be tacit slash implied slash all sorts of things. Does it make it any less binding if it's not in writing? No, not at all. It is still binding, but it's going to be a pain in the backside to prove. Understand that you're going to sit with difficulties in interpretation, whereas if it's in black and white and signed, it is there. You don't need many formalities for a cohabitation agreement, and it saves a heck of a lot of problems. Okay. Then, um, Renal, can we talk about maintenance in out of community of property marriages? Absolutely. Same principles apply as in community of property marriages um, and accrual marriages uh, or out of community with accrual marriages. You look at section 7.2. The only difference is going to be that there won't necessarily be a division of assets beforehand, Renal. So you look at the exact same issues. Existing perspective means earning capacities, obligations, age, duration, and, and, and. It doesn't make it at all less um, enforceable as a claim. It doesn't matter whether it's in, out, or out with accrual. Um, there is potentially a maintenance claim if the Section 72 factors um, are sufficiently present. Right. Uh, can the wife that is working part-time to take care of the children claim for spousal maintenance? Khadija asks. Um, let's go back to Brassie's um, judgment. Let's go to our mediator's favorite judgment of 
Uh, da, 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 MB versus NB 2010. Whether the other spouse earns enough after making proper provision to make good any shortfall in the claimant's income that is exposed. So here it talks about the other spouse's um, income. Um, let's go then from MB. I think MB was a bad starting point. Please bear with me, Khadija. Let's go to uh, EH. Let's go to EH versus SH. They must establish a need to be supported. So let's say, for example, I've got a very interesting matter. Now, I'm acting for the wife. The wife is employed, earning a, really a fraction of what the husband earns. The husband pays her a, a substantial stipend to run the household. Um, now they divorce. Does the fact that she earns 10,000 Rand when he earns 300,000 Rand a month um, disentitle her to maintenance? I say no. But you do need to look at all of these factors. Okay, so let's go back to 7 to the existing or prospective means. So the act acknowledges that there may be existing means of each of the parties. It doesn't say that there must be no means on, let, let's say, for example, in this case, wife, all right? What she earns, I agree with Lee's point, what she earns will be taken into consideration. But I don't foresee that she will be disentitled to spousal maintenance, provided that on a full conspective of all these factors, that sufficient grounds exist and that there is a um, there is potential um, spousal maintenance. There is an interesting case, Khadija, which you could look at if you do have the book by Heaton, uh, Divorce and Dissolution of Life Partnerships. Fantastic book to everyone here. A lot of what I'm doing in these webinars, I'm using, I start off in Heaton and I read up, and then I go delving into the case law to prepare these. So do yourselves a favor if you are financially able to pick up heat and divorce and law of old dissolution of life partnership. She has a fantastic reference to a, an old judgment. I think it's in fact, I don't know if it's even a reported judgment, Pillay versus Pillay. I think it was either Durban or Coastal or it was Peter Maritzburg. It was one of those two. And there the court found that if the wife is young or reasonably young in good health, working, um, or has working at the time of the divorce or has been working during the marriage and has no small children to look after that she will be entitled to little if any maintenance. So what kind of um, what weight there would be to those factors um, is obviously relevant, but it, it, it comes down to the merits of each specific case. I'm sorry, I can't give in, in more specificity. Um, I think to really just sum it up, one, yes, she will potentially be able to claim. Two, the quantum of the claim will be dependent on the party's means and, 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 and. But just the fact that she's working alone, I do not think will disentitle her to maintenance in some way, shape or form. Um, obviously, the court has then also discretion. Is it rehabilitative, lifelong, lump sum or token? Stella, uh, I see you're typing furiously. I'm waiting Bated breath for your question. If you want to put me out of my misery and put your mic on. Uh, name of the book again. It is Law of Divorce and Dissolution of Life Partnerships. It's by Jacqueline Heaton, Jackie Heaton. She's a UNISA prof. Um, she's got quite a few books under her belt. Uh, it's a very, very nice book as a starting point. Um, really, it is worthwhile. Yeah, thanks, Lee, for saving saving my bacon there. As far as I know, it is on take a lot. You can just go on take a lot and search for it. You should find it. Right. Any other questions, folks, before we call it a night? Stella, we are all waiting for you with bated breath. No pressure. Oh, and then it's just to say thanks. I mean, anticlimax. I thought here comes the, the most difficult question of the day. <laughs> Thank 
thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. I always learn so much from your webinars. I really appreciate Anytime, it. Mervyn, Anytime, um, yeah. I, uh, Mervyn, you you missed your calling. You you must really be a trainer, not a not a, an attorney. Listen, <laughs> if my training allows me to meet wonderful people like those who are involved in the session today and form working synergies and working relationships. That is my calling. I absolutely yeah. love it. And uh, Stella, please do give me a call on that matter which you're mediating if you get stuck. Um, it, it is quite a, these late stage divorces, ish, they are very, very difficult. They are very, very tricky. And uh, if you do need a, a financial plan, I've got a few that I can refer you to as well. Thanks, Marvin. Anytime, anytime. Folks, any any questions? Uh, the last hardcore ones of us are, are still in the session. Uh, any closing comments, queries, questions? Um, whilst you are thinking and whilst we wait for hands to go up, we're probably going to do two sessions in April, guys. The first one will probably be, um, I think, if memory serves, I've, we are going to do them on Fridays uh, and we're going to do them so that they don't coincide or clash with the, the Psalm webinars that are taking place. So if my memory serves, guys, we'll probably be doing, I think, the either the first, I think it's the first and then the 20, 21st, I think, somewhere around there. I know there's a public holiday somewhere. We will communicate those to you. We are going to be running an international uh, divorce one again with Shante, who's going to assist me. We're going to have a look at a few things. We've had some interesting cases that have come over our desks in the last couple of months. And then Lee and I are going to do a, quite a lacquer one um, later in April on, and I think we're going to probably call it the Children's, Children's Court Boot Camp. And Lee's going to tell us about her life in the trenches at the, the children's court and what to expect and, 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 and. Uh, folks, for those of you who are here, who are on the group, um, please, you've got my number on there. Please do WhatsApp me if you have any suggestions for um, webinars which you would like to see in the future. We're hoping to do two plus minus in a month. I noticed this month three was a bit hectic for me. Um, but we'll probably do two a month in future. Uh, if you have suggestions of what you would like to see, um, have the assumption that other people might like to see it as well. And uh, and let me know. And we could be uh, hosting your question and uh, talking some nonsense about it. On that note, I don't see any further questions. Thank you so much, guys, for for. Um, taking the time to meet with or to see us and to listen to us. Uh, please do reach out to me, anyone who would love to have some coffee. I had some wonderful coffees in this last week and some lacquer chats. Please do reach out to me. I, I'm absolutely happy to chat with absolutely everyone, whether you're a mediator, social worker, psychologist, attorney, advocate, um, or just a good old family law lawyer like myself. Um, please do get in touch with me. We'd love to meet with you. And thanks, folks. Once again, have a fantastic evening, and I will distribute the info on the next sessions ASAP. Have a lovely evening, and the information contained in this video is distributed free of charge for educational purposes. Whilst we have taken all reasonable steps to ensure that the information contained herein is correct and up to date, Insofar as the law in South Africa is concerned, the law remains a nuanced and complex field of study, replete with many exceptions and conditions. Please, therefore, do not utilize this information as legal advice, which it is not. When in doubt, consult with a legal professional. For more information, please feel free to contact our officers.